let's get to the important conversation around intra-African trade, um, shaping Africa's industrial architecture in an era of disruption. Uh, that's such a critically important conversation, I think, to have, right? And, and I'm very fortunate, we are very fortunate, we have uh, four panelists who are going to take us through all this. Now, the conversation we're having should excite each and every one of you, right? Because it's really at the, at the heart of why we here, right? Uh, which is the type of shifts that not just the continent, but in particular, the, the intra-African trade fair should be able to inspire. Otherwise, what are we doing here, right? So we're very much there. But in terms of this topic, shaping Africa's industrial architecture uh, in an era of disruption, and that key word is disruption, because we really are in this era of disruption. So I'm going to start firstly by, by asking each one of you to, to talk for about three minutes maximum, but I'm going to suggest as you talk, you know this, I'll remind you what I've said before, there are three audiences. There's the audience here, there's the live streaming audience, and there's an audience who will watch this uh, you know, on YouTube channels uh, and other channels in package form later on, and there's also others who will follow it in terms of the words later on. So the words that you say uh, carries tremendous clout because you have a seat at the table, and therefore the message needs to be delivered to them. So if I, if I can start with you, C Commissioner, uh, your thoughts on that topic, shaping Africa's industrial architecture in an era of disruption. What, what do you want to tell us about that? Thank you very much. Uh, quite a lot, but uh, since you said uh, we should be brief, I'm going to be very brief. First, the issue of disruptors. There are several of them. We've got the geoeconomics and the geopolitics which are fragmenting international trade. And uh, this is bringing in trade, high levels of inflation, food insecurity, energy insecurity, among others, as well as disruption of supply chains. Then you have the issue of innovation. We are in the era of Industry 4.0, or the fourth industrial revolution. If a, a, a region, a country, has not built internal capacities to really leverage the opportunities of Industry 4.4, then they are not going to industrialize rapidly. Then we have the exist, existential threat of climate change. And that is bringing in train the question of decarbonization. And some regions are moving very, very fast in this. I can give one example. The European Union. They've come up with the, the cross-border uh, adjustment uh, facility uh, mechanism. Mm. So if you do not meet the standards required in as far as the green transition is uh, involved, you cannot export into that market. And that's a major disruption. Now, the issue is how do we react? And that's how the uh, intra-African trade uh, uh, comes in. We need one large market as a point for recovery, a point for prosperity, and a point for resilience. And in this market, production is the starting point. We need to produce industrial goods of a high quality, very good standards, and uh, which can really meet the needs, not just of Africans, but uh, uh, consumers across the, 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 the world. And this requires development of regional and continental value chains. And to make them distinct, not imitations from other industrial goods being imported from uh, other parts of the world, which actually are going to be dumping. Mm -hmm. You need to invest in, in intermediate uh, uh, production, uh, as well as final goods, 
and that brings in a trend, development of industrial skills and development of facilities for research and development. And uh, let me indicate the final uh, disruption since we came out of it. And this is the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it, it, and the, the reality is that for a long term, the world is going to face major, major uh, health challenges. And the, the lesson to Africa is that uh, for us to, uh, to, 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 to survive the future challenges, the pharmaceutical industry must be well developed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that comment, uh, Commissioner of the AU. Let's, let's move on then to uh, Solomon Queno um, from the African Development Bank. Okay, you've got three minutes to, to make some seriously important points on this issue. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, can you uh, hear me? I can hear you. Okay, yes, no. Yes. Thank, thank you very thank much, you very much Ashraf. Um, I'll try my best not to re uh, repeat what His Excellency has already, uh, you know, talked about. I mean, clearly there are, you know, there are near-term disruptions. Uh, the geopolitics which His Excellency has talked about, uh, we all know that as a result of COVID, we were bottom of the rung in terms of PPEs and vaccine supply. Uh, you know, the Russian-Ukraine war has disrupted the grain market. We know we have to find ways uh, to ensure that we not only feed Africa, uh, but we even feed the rest of the world. But for me, we've been constantly reshaping because we, we are part of global supply chains as Africa, but we're the bottom part of global supply chains. That is the commodity side. And so even before these near-term disruptions, and, and you know, uh, His Excellency is right, you know, the carbon, you know, the carbon border, you know, adjustment mechanism is actually going to really impact, you know, African exports into Europe. Uh, but yes, we're working on the renewable side. But, you know, we've always had to reshape because we've always been at the bottom of the value chain. And, and, and this, is why, this is why we need to focus really on areas where we competitively produce the raw materials as Africa. I mean, the only exception I do agree with His Excellency is pharma. Yes, we don't produce the APIs uh, yet. We import primarily from, you know, from China and India, but we need to also gradually do that for a minimum security of supply for Africa. But otherwise, we need to focus really in the, you know, the value chains where we are competitive. And so this would include agro-processing. 65% of the remaining arable land in the world is in Africa. We are already even producing reasonably well with a, with a smallholder pharma systems. Now, just imagine if we overlay the fourth industrial revolution on that, you know, ag tech, and then we begin to also commercialize, I mean, uh, go into more large-scale commercial farming in, you know, in areas where we're competitive. Uh, you know, we would be able to actually do a lot more in that value chain. So that's why, you know, at the recent Africa Investment Forum, ourselves, AfriExim, Arise, and the Islamic Development Bank signed to be partners of the Alliance for uh, Specialized Agro-Industrial Processing Zones because we really want to address agro-processing and make sure that we, we, we actually, you know, uh, value add in agro-processing and trade among, I mean, and supply within Africa. Uh, cotton to textiles to garments, you know, uh, that's a regional value chain. We have several countries in that space. Uh, we, you know, then we talk about, you know, critical minerals. We produce the critical minerals for the, you know, for the electric vehicle battery supply chain. Why don't we actually value add? Why are we evacuating all of this to other, you know, geopolitical markets that are looking to, you know, create this? We conducted a study with Bloomberg, and it showed that we can actually produce this, uh, Your Excellency, at a third of the cost, uh, you know, relative to, you know, to the developed markets. So we have to find a way to actually attract, you know, you know parties in the developed markets to come and partner with us to produce here. But we should take advantage of our own regional value chains. The critical minerals are in DRC, they're in Zambia. But the biggest industrial uh, nation in Africa is, is your country, South Africa. You know, with CSI, CSIR doing the research and development, why don't we really have that full, you know, regional value chain in place in Africa? So, so for us, you know, we believe that we should focus really where we're competitive, 
take advantage of the fourth industrial revolution, leapfrog in terms of productivity. Yes, there are some challenges in terms of automation, reducing jobs in the labor-intensive industry, but it also creates new jobs. I mean, take a look at what I call the kite. The kite is Egypt, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa when it comes to the fourth industrial revolution. Our youth are using technology you know, to actually enable various industries. Let's take advantage of that. Let's even export that in the future. So for me, it's, it's really not shaping the, you know, the, uh, you know, the value chain, uh, but it's, we continue to reshape. And you know, at the recent Africa Investment Forum, which we held in Marrakesh, actually, November 8th through the 10th, and, and this is a forum that our partners, AfriExim, uh, TDB, Africa 50, AFC, and, and several others, you know, have actually come together to create a transactional platform uh, to actually attract global and African, uh, you know, direct investments into these critical uh, sectors. Uh, the topic for this year was, you know, really unlocking Africa's value chains. And we were able to actually generate serious interest of about $34 billion in Africa's value chains. You know, the regional corridors, we need to do that so that logistic costs make us competitive. We need to take advantage of urbanization. You know, we're beginning to see, I mean, most of the, uh, in fact, Africa is the, is, is, is the fastest urbanizing continent. Let's take advantage of that to create pockets of demand. So look, uh, we'll continue to reshape. The opportunities are there. Um, yes, we're not as diversified in that space now, but we have to be deliberate about it. Okay, thank you. And I'm, and I'm sort of hoping that in terms of doing that, that there's a, there's a greater assertiveness about doing that, what you've just said. But we'll, we'll get to that uh, in a moment. Let me bring in the, the third of the, of the panelists, um, Haisam Al-Mayergi, uh, the newly appointed Executive Vice President of Afraksim uh, Bank. Um, right, you, you've heard the others. Uh, you have a strong view on this. I know that. Uh, you've got three minutes. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure if it's uh, okay. like working. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Thank okay, you. So, so let me put it this way. Um, our organization should be contributing in terms of building capacity and building rails for youth, for investors, for traders, for this jump to happen. And if we want to think about it, we have to have a short-term plan and a long-term plan. Short-term plan is the obvious. If you look at the previous presentation, we are trading at 17% intra-Africa, while the Europeans of the world and the Chinese and the Asians are looking at 70. From 1.7 to 7.0, there is a huge gap that all countries need to be serious about. How are they joining the payment and settlement system Pan-Africa? How are they uh, being part of talking to their customs and easing things because we have a long way to go. There's a lot of practical examples that we really need to um, work hardly on and not just talk about it in terms of every uh, of the um, countries around the continent. This is short term, this will help us in short term, but in the long term, I think we should be obsessed with building youth capacity and building it what <coughs> enable us to, in the future, when we think about industrialization, we don't yet again go and import machines from outside the continent, experts from outside the continent, so that they can teach us how to go to the next level of production. We need to have our people building this for us. And for us to do this, this is mean education, uh, spending a lot on job certification, and, 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 and this is our future. And if you think about it, I would rather have a, 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 an engineering medical college that and invest in this that will graduate people who will do 100 hospitals while I invest in a hospital, but the same investment I can put it and build 100. Same thing of building our factories, of building capacity. So a big, a big part of our focus should be directed into really educating the African young population, which we are the youngest continent on the planet, into creating the real power and also teach them how to start where other ends. We don't need to go through the process that every other content went through. So what is the trend now? It's digitization, it's ESG. We can look at experiences from places like India and China where they build capacity through educating in technology and exporting this manpower to the world in outsource bases and so on. 
So a lot of work we done short term in terms of opening borders, in terms of payments, but long term, if we're really serious about changing the history, it's all about building capacity for our youth and their education. And you certainly left us lots to, lots to think about. Thanks for those uh, opening, uh, opening thoughts, right? Let me then uh, bring in um, Sion Leo, who's the group CEO of AFG Holdings, uh, which is, of course, the Atlantic Group. So you've got, you've got three minutes. Thank you to make a point. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ashra. Uh, I, I will try and make it in English. Uh, OK. <laughs> For my neighbor, too. <laughs> yes, <laughs> to, yeah, to go follow. ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So um, uh, first of all, uh, as a global player in terms of banking and insurance, and as part of the global Atlantic Group uh, that is Founded, that has been founded, and that is led by a Pan African champion. You may know him, I believe, Mr. Dosangi Kone. Uh, we are honored and pleased to contribute to this panel discussion today and share our vision for our continent development. Thanks to African Bank for this opportunity that is given to us. Indeed, the last decade, as it has already been said, has witnessed a significant decrease in the agricultural sector contribution to the GDP of most countries across Africa. But, was, but this was mainly to the benefit of the tertiary sector uh, due to the soaring of some key subsectors like telecommunications, finance, transport, and distribution. The uh, consequence of this is our continent remaining dependent on others to both transform our raw materials and to provide us with manufactured products needed in our daily life. Clearly, it is now time, and this is what we are doing now, to strategize on how to reduce <coughs> this dependency by setting up a sound Africa industrialization agenda. This will include structuring global markets, being them regional or continental, and allocating the value chain based on the potential of each country or region. Indeed, industrialization, being capital intensive, requires strong and long-term committed financial players. This clearly matches the vision of our group, the AFG group, as we intend to be the financial partner in banking and insurance of all economic players who work at transforming our continent. Thus, we will be supporting governments, especially in building infrastructure needed by industries, but we will also be, of course, financing private sector companies from SMEs to large corporates. We will be also financing uh, public sector and institutions, institutional, sorry, and indeed individuals who in the end are the consumers of the products produced. We will be doing it, of course, alongside with our fellow uh, bank, banking uh, players, uh, being them at continental level, as African Bank, AFDB, African Development Bank, and others, and with uh, regional or local banks. So this panel is really welcome for AFG to recall our commitment as a Pan-African financial player, both in banking and insurance, I insist, because we are also an insurance company group, as we continue expanding our group throughout the continent. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. So, so moving on, let me just encourage you uh, in the half an hour or so we have remaining, uh, to keep it pretty loose. So, so if you have any one of you, if you have an opinion, just raise your hands. If you agree with your panelists or you disagree, just raise your hands and say, I'd like to add my own opinion. I want to keep it pretty, pretty open as opposed to too structured. But having said that, here's the one that I want to keep structured, but I want a very quick 30-second answer, just 30 seconds, right? You see, we can talk about disruption. We can talk about creating new value change. Um, for the continent, and we all agree on that. But here's the big question. What is Africa's USP? What is our unique selling proposition? What, 
makes us globally competitive? So I don't want the long answer. I want a quick thought about this one. Let, let me start with you. What, what, in 30 seconds, just what makes us globally com competitive as a, as a continent? I think um, the youngest continent, second, uh, the resources we have, but third and, most, and mostly is that we have a long way to go for us to move from extra trade to intra trade, which is actually a lot of money coming in, a lot of saving to every, con every, every so there is a lot of money to be made of the thing that we were missing on the, in the past that we can do now with the two resources, human and... and okay, interesting way to take it. I mean, young, you made the point, but the fact that we've done so little means we can do so much more. I exactly. mean, in fact, what you're saying, exactly. that's really important. Exactly. Okay, what about your thoughts, our, our USP? So, so I think, uh, look, I, our primary USP is the fact that we are blessed and endowed with great minerals and arable land. Yeah, so, so that's the input into almost all value chains globally. It starts in Africa, it ends elsewhere. But a lot of times, it starts and then we send it in commodity form and then we import you know, the finished products. We need to move up the value chain. But I do agree as well uh, with him that going forward, our USB is our youth. Very dynamic, growing. And, and IT specialists, that's good. And therefore, forward. lots more time needs to be spent in investing, in, in building those, the yes. young, the youth of Africa into, into, into the champions that we speak about, right? Yeah. Your thoughts in terms of our USP, His Excellency? We are a young population and a growing population. Our demographers indicated that our experts around the world is that from now onward up to the year 2100, Africa's population is going to grow. And the, in the invest communicate, in the investment community, he's an investor. They are always going to tell you that uh, demography is destiny. So the future of Africa in terms of population uh, really is going to be shaped uh, in a very advantageous manner because of uh, being a young population. Number two. In terms of natural resource endowment, we are the richest region in the world. Mm, the richest region in the world. But in terms of economic development, we are the poorest region in the world. To prosper, we need to add value to those resources. There is a, 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 a foundation in India They've made a preliminary estimate of the value of Africa's natural endowment. And their preliminary figure is 193 trillion US dollars. Match that against the, our aggregate GDP of 3.4 trillion US dollars. The opportunity is vast, and we can sell that one. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and. Uh, uh, Sionne, if you can, just let me know if you can hear me clearly. I asked what, what makes Africa globally competitive? What like makes Africa globally, globally competitive? What, what gives us an edge? Com yeah. com competitive, okay. Yeah. Uh, th thanks, thanks. Thank you very much, Ashra. Uh, of course, as um, His Excellency just, just said, Africa is rich uh, for the, the uh, um, uh, demographic dividends of the youth of its population for international resources, we have all of this. So what would make us uh, competitive, uh, I believe is uh, first having vision. Having vision on what we want to be, what we want to become, what we want to do with the resources we have. We have. These resources are so much important. And once we have a vision, uh, we need to have more action More action, it means uh, we, need, we need to be more focused on hard work. Because when you look at Asian countries, they were coming from far, but they were able to deliver very fast in just a span of decades because of hard work, thanks to hard work, vision and hard, hard work. Uh, and then uh, we need to ensure that uh, we, uh, let's say, uh, drive the best from our population. 
how do we educate our people? Our population is growing fast, but it needs to be educated, well educated. So what is the system we put in place? But all this is about vision. If you have a vision, if you have a clear strategy to reach your ambitions, if you have, you give yourself the means to it is possible. So but, we, but, but do we, uh, do we, do we have a vision? Uh, and I believe, sorry. Yeah. Do we, do we have a vision? Well, uh, I mean, uh, when you look at what is happening currently on, uh, on our continent, you, you see that vision is not enough there. It's not enough there. Or at least it's um, implementation is not that obvious. But I believe that such uh, occasions that, that uh, African Bank is giving to the continent such opportunities, give uh, a chance uh, to uh, discuss, to talk, uh, to, to, to give uh, uh, some insights and, and um, see how our governments, how our leaders are, uh, are transforming their vision. I believe it is, it is coming. Clearly, you can see it in some countries, it is coming, and we need to continue and push and fuel, and fuel this, this move. We can make it. Uh, and, and I'm sure All we'll right. be there. I think, I think the issue so, of vision is, so Ashraf, is particularly I, I, I important. To, you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah I, want to, I want to take advantage of the fact that you've asked us to disrupt you. I've, I've done that. Okay. Um, you know, there's one other aspect that I, I want to emphasize. I mean, we've touched on it, but let me emphasize it. It's really the fact that we have a growing consumer market, okay, that's also more middle income. So, this is the destination for, you know, for groups that want to invest and grow their business. And, and let me expand just very briefly. We just had the Africa Investment Forum. 80 companies from Japan came. A lot of times in the past, Japanese companies have been interested in Africa, and, and Your Excellency, you'll probably confirm this, has been more really for the extractive industries evacuation whether it's LNG, whether it's you know, nickel, et cetera. But you know, the likes of Sumitomo, the likes of Mitsubishi, the likes of Mitsui are actually investing in African companies for B2C, business to consumer, which surprised me. Yeah. Okay. And part of the reason is they have a dwind, rapidly dwindling population in Japan. So they've got to look for you know, the next big consumer markets. And that is what Africa is providing. Not just a large consumer market. I mean, we have 1.2 billion people. And this is why the CFTA is critical. The CFTA creates a large single market as opposed to fragmented 54 markets, right? So a lot of investors globally who play for the long term are paying attention. Let's make sure that we actually develop this market further. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, I, I think talking about the, the, the AFCFT is, is particularly important. I want to, want to get your thoughts on this uh, from, 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 the, 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 from the bank's perspective. Uh, yeah, I mean, how, what's your take on that? I mean, a lot has been spoken about it. Uh, it should create this, this monolith, this one block. Uh, you know, what do you want to take out of it in terms of the leverage we can have internally and externally as one block. Yeah, so, 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 so basically this is aiming as exactly what has been said. This is the largest growing label market and consumer market. So, and, and in an age where other areas of the world are either aging or declining in population, you have a very clear advantage now that you need to unlock yourself. So, so what this is doing is that basically by removing tariffs and non-tariffs for products and services, this is unleashing the, the, the wealth of labor and resources we're having and using the near shore and everything. The whole idea to your point, so what can we do more? I think, as we said before, to move from 1.7 to 7.0 in terms of inter-trade or to save the $5 billion that we are losing every year in our payments using third currency intermediaries, we really need to put our hearts and minds as governments, as central banks around it in terms of quickly adapting to the local payment systems, quickly adapting our tax and tariffs to, to this, because this is the future of a lot of our countries. While they're busy with a huge agenda, I think this is one part of the agenda that needs to go up uh, across, across Africa. 
in, 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 and as you've seen in the previous session, uh, the bank used to do a lot of things in terms of the cross-border guarantees, uh, guarantees program. We need to do a lot together to comfort investors as they go into Africa. We're trying to focus on areas like agro, automotive, also in terms of financing, but uh, and also not only financing, but also advocacy. So us together, we can do a lot of efforts in pushing it, but I think it's the honors in every country around the continent to start to see that this is a big part of my agenda. I need to push it because the opportunity there is humongous in terms of the gap. We have a lot of money to make that we didn't make before. Very important. Well, you know, I often talk um, from where I sit on, on the Champion South Africa platform, I talk about, I say, champion people, champion nation, and therefore by extension, champion people, champion continent. So maybe while I've got you here, just you spoke earlier on about, um, about the youth, right? So what's your thoughts from, from, from the bank side um, around uh, benefits around knowledge sharing platforms? Because I would think all of that has to be focused on the largest untapped market on the continent. Yes. So, so the biggest example of knowledge sharing is what we're doing today and this week. And, and the idea of talking together and sharing the knowledge, whether in a forum like this or every time peer-to-peer -peer people meet, is where the business will understand more SMEs and other businesses and modify and find the right finance for it, is where the government will understand around the content the real need for, for, free, for people that we do this. In our side, we did a lot of initiatives, and I think most of the um, people behind it did. Like We have this uh, academy that we're looking at um, sponsoring 100,000 uh, graduates around, around 60 subjects that we're, we find important. And again, back to where I started, we really need to invest in this knowledge sharing, but also in, in education. And not only education, there's a, a bigger trend that's happening now, which is job certification. And there's a huge difference between training and job certification, because a lot of our youth might get training, might get knowledge in their college, but when they try to compete with someone from other content on a remote job, they fail because there's a big difference between are you ready for the job in terms of soft skill, hard skill, education, or are you just got a certificate from a college? So a lot of work needs to be done. I think one of the major experts that can come out of the continent because of the youth population that we have is the technology expert in terms of people where, as you see, people trying to work with companies offshore, supporting them in programming and development, for example, while sitting home and, 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 and getting okay. their dollars into their country. A lot of work to be done, topic that I'm really passionate about. Very much so. Well, I'll tell you what, we've got about five minutes to go, and, and, and that pressure can be magnified in terms of the pressure on the continent, you know, meaning there's... This, I've got time pressures, but the continent's got time pressures. We need to move with, with a great sense of urgency about things. And, and therefore, I want to ask you, uh, uh, His Excellency um, Albert uh, Bushanga, from the, from the AU perspective, to just talk about what's the one thing holding us back that will prevent us from achieving all the things that we, that we want to achieve? I think one of the things that is holding us back is a belief that... He, aid is going to develop Africa. Africa must really come out of that type of thinking and start believing that if we have to develop, we have to do it ourselves. And I always emphasize that development is a do-it-yourself process. Now, let's look at the industrial architecture of Africa as it is now. In my view, it is not satisfactory. Why? It's anchored on imitation. And that imitation is reflected is that quite a number of African industrial activities are anchored on the global value chain. And Africa is at the end of the global value chain. The marketing, the industrial design, the branding, even the leadership is done outside Africa. So when it comes now to appropriation of value from industrial activity, we get very, very, very little. To come out of that, 
we need to start investing in internal capabilities. First and foremost, development of industrial skills across the Africa. We need trained factory workers, supervisors, factory managers, factory directors. We need people trained in research and development. And it takes some time. And it's for this reason that we at the African Union have been advocating for the establishment of an, um, an African Manufacturing Institute. Because without that, it's very, very, very difficult to really do something. I can give you an example. A Chinese company in, uh, a, a company in China is able to supply iPhones on behalf of uh, the owner of the technology throughout the world. Now, let me ask a very simple question. As we are talking now, which African factory can fully supply the market of the African continent of retail area of 1.4 billion people? If you go in a shop, you say it's made in country X, and you find it in all the African Union member states. Which African factory can do that? There's none. Mm -hmm. So we have not invested in scale. Well, I'll, I'll so there, those are some of the challenges that we face. A lot. And we need to resolve it. Well, there you are. A lot needs to change. I mean, I, if, if I can just, uh, we're going to wrap up now in two minutes or so. Uh, Sionle, if I can bring you in on this one. And I want to use a football example, uh, soccer, football. If you, you know, if Africa is the attacking players, if we, we the number 10, the playmakers trying to make things happen, we're up against a team of defenders who don't want us to score goals, right? I mean, why I'm asking that question is which economic block that may even talk about collaboration and, and co-creation, I'm not talking of Africa outside, which ones are, are going to open the, the way for us willingly or do we have to find another way to score the goal? The, the image is a very good one uh, about football and how we can strategize and score a goal while defenders are looking at preventing us to do so, uh, of course. Um, I believe uh, His, Excellency, His Excellency has said almost everything already. He said we need to train our champions. We need to find our own way of playing the game, not playing with the roles of others. We need to, de to do less imitation and we must not be counting on others to support us to get there. It is on our own that we will make it. And I, be, I've, I think all has been said uh, in, in this. So uh, if we want uh, to be able to uh, win uh, and, and to, to score a, a goal uh, uh, despite uh, the strength of the defense we, ha we, have, we have to face, uh, I believe we, we, as I said, we need this vision and we need this ap uh, appropriation, this ownership, we need the, this, this ownership. And I believe that some tools like uh, the EFCFT, you say in English, EFCFTA, uh, are vision tools because it starts changing the world of the game because Absolutely. we define our own roles. Yeah. We say now Africa needs to be able to, to be in, more integrated. We need to be more integrated. We need to be more uh, together in, 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 in Africa. We need not to only be oriented uh, towards uh, out of Africa. Absolutely. And this, yeah. this is very key and, and this is a very good, very good step. Now we need to implement it because it's not just words, it's how you make it. Uh, and, and I said uh, it means focusing on implementation and it means hard work. <coughs> Nothing will come overnight. You will have to work and build it. We need champions, African champions. We need not only to direct us to show the way, but also 
to be able to coordinate and create this uh, ownership of value chains that we can spread across regions, across the, across the continent. Very important. Thank you for that. And therein lies the challenge. I mean, the value chain is obvious, to use the football example again. Goalkeeper, defenders, <laughs> defensive midfield, attacking midfield, yeah. strikers score the goal. That's the value chain. If we understand that, we've got it right. Uh, I'm uh, going to uh, ask uh, you the uh, last uh, question. Uh, sorry. Uh, you want uh, to just answer uh, sorry. sorry. And you can be as good as you want. If the referee is with the defender, you will not win. Well, <laughs> ah, there we are. Thank you. Okay. All right. Just 15 seconds, yeah? No, so the other football analogy is own goal. Well, we need to actually, I mean, if there were ever a better time to have the political commitment to the implementation of the CFTA, it is now, post-COVID. We ha because without that political commitment, we are scoring the, our own own goals, yeah. So for me, African champions are very key. McKinsey did a study. African champions are really billion dollar companies that operate across borders. There are about 400 of them. They can make industrialization work in Africa. They will benefit the SMEs in their corporate value chains. We really need to implement the CFTA once and for all and allow these African champions to become what? Global African champions who started in Africa. And I see my good friend Manuel sitting here. Manuel is a good example of an African champion that started in Africa and expanded you know, to Latin America and other places. And, and we, we need want more, more of those. We want more of the same. Well, that's, yes. where, that's where I'm going to leave it. Uh, so it's, it's full time, let's call it that, in, in football analogy once again. Interesting, you spoke about the own goal. Uh, just, just yesterday, I think Paul Kagame from Rwanda said, and I'm going to quote him, if the owners of the natural resources go around begging, then you should know there's something wrong with our minds. If the owners of the natural resources go around begging, then you should know there's something wrong with their minds. And that's a massive challenge that we all need to wrap up with. But I'll end with the flip side of that. And again, another sporting example. South Africa's rugby team has just won the World Cup, right? And, and the captain of the team, Sia Kolisi, comes from one of the most impoverished regions in our country, with one of the most impoverished backgrounds, to not just lead a team, but in my opinion, to be seen as probably one of the great sporting captains in the world in all sports, and I really do follow sport, right? And they premised their winning campaign on a campaign called Stronger Together. So I'm saying that because from the own goal of the resources and begging to the goal of being stronger together, if we can be stronger together in rugby, why can't we be stronger together in everything throughout our entire continent. That'll make us the champion continent. Thank you so much. Give them the biggest applause you can give them. Thank you. <laughs>